Um, first of all, first of all, can I uh, thank you, Ken, for having invited me. This, is this? Yes. You can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. But I also want to especially thank uh, Eva, Carme and Francesca for having organised this conference and having organised it with such efficiency but also with such warmth. And I, I, I really do appreciate that. So uh, thank you to the, um, to the organisers. Now, yesterday I realised that I was in a room of uh, talented and committed educationists. After last night, I realise I'm in a room with talented and committed dancers. <laughs> and that, that, is especially, um, that is especially pleasing. Now, I'm going to talk to you about a particular course at the University of Huddersfield, starting from talking about England and then uh, narrowing down to this, uh, to this course, uh, Huddersfield, where I am a professor. Now, many of you will be asking the question, where is Huddersfield? If you, if, you follow, if you follow Premier League football, you will know precisely where Huddersfield is. It's at the bottom of the league. <laughs> but Huddersfield, for those of you who don't follow football, is between Leeds and Manchester in the north of England. It is a former industrial mill town. Um, so at one time, for maybe three or four generations, was fabulously wealthy during the Industrial Revolution, and then that kind of fell away. And indeed, many of the buildings... Of the, of, of the University of Huddersfield are old mill buildings. And in the summertime, there's a particular building on Huddersfield campus, a brick building, and it's an old mill. And when it heats up in the summer, you walk into it and you can smell the wool. And it always makes me think about the men and women who work there and on what we're doing and whether we can live up to their expectations for what they wanted for, um, for the time. Now, what I'll be talking about is something really quite different, I think, from what Cathy was talking about this morning. Because, as I will, this is, this is our, our university. And the first point I would make is that we are a very diverse university. So although we do have refugee students, really what I'm talking about is a very well-established black and minority ethnic community. There are other forms of diversity which I'll talk about. But we have a large proportion of black and minority ethnic students who are British. They are well established, they are second and third generation. So this is a different experience from the refugee experience really. We do have refugees but that's not what I'll be focusing on. We are, resp we are responding better to that diversity. Let me be clear, I am not suggesting that you should follow the model of the University of Huddersfield. What I am suggesting is that you might learn from some of what we have done, good and bad. We have made mistakes, so let me tell you about what we have done. But we are not, we are certainly not the leading university in this area. And I will mention a university later on which I think is doing very interesting things and which I think is worth looking at. The other po point I will come back to and keep coming back to is that committed leadership is crucial, both at the institutional level, but also at the level of course, that people who are committed to making a difference, that is absolutely crucial. And finally, the point that I will make continually through this is that good data is also crucial. Now, what do I mean by good data? We are fortunate, and I do think that we're fortunate, in the United Kingdom that we are obliged, we are legally obliged, to collect very detailed data on all of our students, right from school, university, and throughout, through taxation, so we can, we can model, we can see what is happening. Now, let me look at... This is from the Higher Education Funding Council of England. So it's an official body, it no longer exists actually, it's been uh, changed by, into a different organisation. So this is disabled, and um, this is for disabled students, and that's for BAME students. Now, what Hesky have done is they have modelled what a student should get based on their entry qualifications. So if a student gets really good grades, A's, they should be getting this grade. If a, a student comes with a lower, something that these are to do with points, you'd expect them to get lower. And what they have modelled is what they would predict if there's no disability, and then what happens if students have got a disability. So there's a gap. There's a gap. Not such a huge gap. Now look at this. This is for BME, Black and Minority Ethnic Students. Again, look at these grades, and you can see that's what you would expect a student to get. 
and that's what black students, black minority ethnic students, actually get. There's a gap. Now that particular statistic, I think, is the most important one for driving change. Because very often, colleagues, good people, will say, well, these minority ethnic students, they come with lower grades. And you can say, yes, that may be true, but look at the gap. Look at the gap. So we can put it this way, and this is from this, is from this year. Again, this is for the whole of England, but this data is available right down to course level. And I think it helps to drive, to drive change. So first to upper second class degrees, these are good degrees in British terms. You can see that white students get 82.2% of white students get good degrees. And then it drops black, Asian and mixed. Now, looking at looking at this, this is the what in this is in statistical terms, this is the observed difference. This is the this is the important statistic. Unexplained difference. Now let me be clear, that's unexplained in statistical terms. In other words, it's not within the model. So that is not explained by the entry qualification, but I think you can explain this. You can explain it because of discrimination, and frankly, you can explain it because of racism. So it's this figure that's the most important one. And when I asked the question yesterday about what single thing could policymakers do to incentivize diversity, the single thing they could do is, for every 1%, your university narrows this gap, we'll give you 1% more funding. That would change universities. That would change universities. And so that's, that's why statistics really, really matter, both at an institutional level, course level, and so on. And I will keep, I will keep coming back to that. OK, um, again, just think about statistics. The University of Huddersfield is, look, I like it. It's a good university, but it's not an elite university. Within the United Kingdom, we heard about the chasing of, of Emmanuel was talking about it, the chasing of trying to get the QS 300 or whatever it is, constantly trying to climb the greasy pole. Now, Huddersfield is a mid-range university, but it is very much a local university. Many of our students, most of our students, come from the local area. Now, this is from the 2001 census. Kirklees is the local authority within which Huddersfield sits. Now, I chose the 2001 census because 17 years ago, many of those students, at least traditional students, are, um, are, are um, about to come to um, the University of Huddersfield. So you can see 79% white and about 21% um, from other, other communities. Let me be clear though, these are well-established communities. They've been there for generations, many of them, uh, many of them since, since the war. But I'm glad to say that the University of Huddersfield is even more diverse than the community that it serves. And I think that is a strength of the, um, of the university. OK, this is where I work. This is the uh, School of Education and Professional Development. Again, you can see it's in an old mill building. There is, you can't see, there's a canal just here. It's really very nice. Come and visit me. <laughs> you, would be, you would be welcome. I will, sh I will show you around. I'll show you around the time. Now, the School of Education and Professional Development is even more diverse than the diverse university, except in relation to gender. It's a school of education, so you would expect it's overwhelmingly female. The staff are overwhelmingly female. The senior leadership men. is overwhelmingly men. It's, it's true. I mean, I, I hope to be part of the solution. I find myself part of the problem mm -hmm. in relation to promotion and, uh, and so on. I mean, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's not good, frankly. Not good. But it is very, um, it, it is even more diverse. So let me give you some examples of this. Again, Statistics are important here, and then I'll talk about the particular course, the particular adult education course. So, black and minority ethnic students. I know that's a very blunt, we can break them down more, it's a very blunt way of doing it, but just to give you an impression. So at the university, we've got about, well, this year, about 32, 33%, so about a third of our students come from ethnic minorities. Now, many of those are international students, but most are British, British-born, uh, black minority ethnic students. But you can see the School of Education, even more so. 40, it's about 43% um, this year. 
So that's BAME, Black and Minority Ethnic Students. Polar data. Now, polar data is, I said it's a proxy for deprivation. It doesn't really measure deprivation. It actually measures the likelihood of young people attending university in a particular area. It's a spatial measurement, but it is used as a proxy for deprivation. Now, you have to be aware, always you have to be cautious about statistics. You can see there's a significant jump here, and that's because it was measured differently. But nevertheless, you can see the, you can see the pattern that um, in these measure those students who come from areas where young people are least likely to attend university. And so the University of Huddersfield, um, what's that, about 40, well, about 49% come from those, those backgrounds. If it was the University of Leeds or Manchester or Oxford or Cambridge, it would be about there. It would be about there. Uh, but you can see, again, the School of Education is um, even, more, even more diverse. Now, there's another measure which has become particularly important and which will lead me into talking about uh, the teacher training course. And this is this one, what we, have, what we refer to as commuter students. I was interested when the rector, um, um, George, was speaking yesterday about the experience, the traditional experience for students. So when I went to university, I left home, I lived in halls of residence, I was a student. That's what I was. Our students, most of our students, live at home. They commute. They commute. Many of them commute quite long distances. And that means that their experience of university is very different to my experience of university. I could go to clubs, I could do sports, I had the whole day, essentially. They come in, often they will try to get the cheap train, which means it gets them in just before class. They will dash to class, do what they need to do, and then get back home because they've got caring responsibilities, uh, whether for parents or for, or, or, um, or for children. And so we've had to think carefully about the curriculum and we've had to think carefully about what the university as a whole provides this, these students who are now, as I say, um, uh, a majority at the, at the university and certainly within the School of Education. And that is especially true for adult students that I'll come on to in a moment. But I did want to just share something with you. Um, the number of, uh, I'll show you in a slide coming up, the proportion of adult students, so that students who start their course after the age of 22 or after, has dropped significantly in the United Kingdom, in, in England especially. It is very, really very small. So I just looked the figures up for Huddersfield before I came this morning. So we've got 12,855 undergraduate students. We've got postgraduate as well. But undergraduate students, just under 13,000. We've got 765 part-time adults part-time adults. It has hemorrhaged, and that's as a direct result of government policy. Now let me be clear, the government policy was not to reduce the number of part-time adult students. That's not what they intended to do. They just didn't consider part-time adult students. They just overlooked them. That was not their experience. They just, they were not even, they weren't on the radar. They were invisible. So when they brought in loans, loans were not available for part-time students, which just meant overnight um, part-time students, 50% drop immediately, stop going to universities. But we do have some courses where we still, uh, we still have adults, I am uh, glad, uh, I'm glad to say. So a quick overview then in terms of England. So English society <coughs> is very diverse and very unequal. But that diversity and inequality is unevenly distributed. It's even unevenly distributed within our, uh, within our university. The higher education sector, which is highly differentiated, reflects that society. Which is why I am slightly... I'm not altogether convinced that universities... I'm I tend to agree with Camilla. I, I, I'm not altogether convinced that universities can change society because they reflect society. And so the prejudices, the... It, the inequalities are reproduced through, um, uh, through universities. And just here's the, the, the figure. Between 2010 and 2017, the numbers of mature students, part-time and full-time, have dropped by 60% across England. I mean, I think that, that's a catastrophe, frankly. That's a catastrophe. But it's been, it's been allowed to happen. But despite all of that, and this is the crucial point, 
tutors can still make a difference for, um, for individuals. So what, what can we do? What can we do? Well, this is from um, Barbara Reed and some of her colleagues. Academic culture is not uniformly accessed or experienced. Students from non-traditional backgrounds are disadvantaged by institutional cultures that place them as other. There is a need for initiatives to focus on cultural aspects of the academy, such as methods and styles of teaching and learning. Those are things that we do have control over, and that's why tutors can make a difference. And then what um, Hocking has said um, in a report for the Higher Education Academy, inclusive learning and teaching in higher education refers to the ways in which pedagogy, curricula and assessment are designed and delivered to engage students in learning that is meaningful, relevant and accessible to all. That is something, again, that tutors do have control over. So at an individual level, we have agency to um, make a difference. And I think that we have at least tried to make a difference in relation to this teacher training course. Now, this is the course I will talk about is teacher education for the further education sector. Um, these students are all mature students. They can't be otherwise. So they will be, some of them are in their 20s, but the average age is 30, I think it's about 33 now. It's dropping. It used to be, it used to be higher, but it's about, it, the average age is about, uh, about 33. But let me tell you about the further education sector, um, first of all. Many of you will not be familiar with it. So the further education sector in England, the FE sector, students are mainly aged 16 to 19. So these are, the, these are teachers who are not going to work in schools. They're going to work in colleges. Colleges, 16 to 19 year olds. But these colleges include a very large adult cohort. It's where adult education takes place. It's within further education colleges. The FE sector is mainly vocational, mainly vocational, but it includes a very large academic um, uh, provision as well, including degrees. And this is the important point for a network like this one, in, in, in interested in continuing uh, education. The great majority of teachers in FE train as mature students after a career in their occupational area and whilst working part-time. So they may have been hairdressers and now they're training to teach hairdressing. They may have been engineers and now they are training to, um, uh, to become teachers of engineers. But they are teachers at the same time. So they are working. They are, um, they are part time. We do some pre-service as well, but the great majority are um, of, of, of this kind. So we were interested in particularly, and so what I'll, I'll focus on for a moment, in the experience of black and minority ethnic teachers who are doing this, this training. Now, because we are academics, we carried out research. We wanted to know what we were doing. And to follow Emmanuel's point, I'm glad to say we involved the teachers in that research. We didn't just research on them. We researched with black minority ethnic um, uh, teachers, uh, trainee teachers. I should say the first problem is there aren't very many. You know, uh, although the further education sector is very diverse, it's not when you look at the teaching staff. It's not when you look at the teaching staff. Actually, that's true of our university as, as well, for that matter. So we carried out research into these trainees. Not surprisingly, there is no common BAME trainee experience, partly due to the complexity of the category. It's a very blunt category. The experiences of trainees from similar ethnic backgrounds are shaped as much by gender, social class, and other forms of difference as, a, as ethnicity. And actually, if I had to choose one, it would be social class has most impact, but, you know, we live in a, okay, let me speak for, speak for, for England. England is a highly racialized society, and, um, you know, the experience of black people living in England is related to class, but uh, race is also uh, absolutely um, apparent. Racism is absolutely apparent. Although participants' views were uneven, Many British-born BAME trainees did state that their ethnic background had affected their career trajectory, sometimes both uh, directly and, um, and indirectly. There is some evidence that BAME trainees undertake a more limited range of teaching activities. So when they were on placement, there was some evidence that they had a narrower experience. There are patterns of subject specialism and previous vocational experience which are likely to limit BAME trainees' opportunities. Now, that's not something we have complete control over, but it's something that we 
tried to work with. And finally, the proportion of BAME trainees with good honours degrees is lower. So, what can we do to address these concerns? Well, let me uh, suggest a few things that we've tried uh, with varying degrees of success. A new curriculum. Allow me to come on to that in a moment or two. We have, we have brought in a new curriculum, but I want to show you how we structured that new curriculum. Outreach activities. We actively set about trying to recruit more potential trainee teachers from black minority ethnic um, uh, black minority ethnic teachers to be honest with limited success the problem is that they have to have a job before they join our course which means we are not choosing the students the colleges are choosing the students so we may have a very open a very progressive um, policy for recruiting and we do colleges may not so that's something that you know we had limited limited success although I still think we should do it mentoring every one of these trainees has a mentor um, and we have tried to you know think about how um, uh, the mentoring of black uh, black minority ethnic um, uh, teachers trainee teachers might help again I'm not sure I'm not sure that, that we've been all that successful there, to be honest. What I think has made a difference is understanding that these students, and indeed all of the students, are commuter students, and therefore thinking about the time of day that we um, set up the curriculum, the kind of events, if you like, the extracurricular events that we've, uh, that we've organised, what time of day they were at, how we could persuade people to come, arranging some of this to happen at weekends, not just during the working week. But above all, there has been an explicit commitment to diversity. And that alone, I think, has made some difference. Now, I am being cautious here. This has not been transformative. It has not been. I wish it had been. It's not. But we have made some differences. Now, partly, we are going along with what I've called here university-wide initiatives. We have a student union which is very active in this area. And we have student union they call themselves BAME ambassadors on every committee. Now, that can be tokenism, and at one level it is tokenism. But I'll tell you, there is a BAME ambassador, I, I chair the school teaching and learning committee, so it's a big sort of bureaucratic committee. The BAME ambassadors come along and they shake it up. <laughs> they ask awkward questions. They say, for example, there's a woman, um, Muslim, with a scarf, young woman, very articulate. She said, what advice? What advice do you give young Muslim women who wear the scarf about what they should wear when they're on an interview for a placement? Because you tell the men they should wear a shirt and tie, you tell you know, white women they should wear whatever. What do you tell them? And we thought, <laughs> yeah, abs yeah, absolutely. What? And, and even, even actually, should I wear the scarf? And we're saying, well, you know, absolutely. And if you do, you know, we just... These are questions which I'm ashamed to say we have not even considered. So although it could be tokenism, it, in practice it has not been. And also the student union running this campaign, which they have kind of called, how white is your curriculum? Well, actually very white is, what our, is how our curriculum was. Including a review of all the reading lists and every course across the university. Now that's, you know, that has... That has, made, um, that has made something of a difference. And the course, this teacher training course, has been, has been part of that. So the student union um, has helped. We've also carried this out. And Kings Kingston University, <coughs> let me you know, uh, congratulate Kingston University, who have done enormous amounts in this area. And if you get the slides, you can click through to what they have done. We have really learnt from their inclusive curriculum framework that I'll show you um, in a moment, which has shaped our new, um, our new course. Now, I will blow it up in a second, but I just wanted to do... This is, what, this is what the framework boils down to. So, you can click through to it at some time. And say, let me be clear, it's Kingston University. We have borrowed it. Um, you know, that they generously share it. They want it to be used. So, when we were planning the course, <coughs> the new course... We worked through these categories. I'll blow them up for you in, um, in just a moment. But we, 
we didn't say that all of these boxes should be filled, but we wanted course teams to at least consider these questions. Now, let me blow it up. So the first part of it. You see the questions at the top. How can you make the course more accessible? How can you enable students to see themselves reflected in the curriculum? And how can you equip students for a global, diverse environment? Importantly, this will benefit all students. That's an important principle, actually. So, <coughs> through content, this is the one that is easiest to, easiest to complete. That you, you change your reading list. You make sure that there are non-white, non-European um, writers and thinkers on your course. But getting people to think about their delivery, getting people to question the assumptions that they have about the students that they have, their experiences, and their expectations of behaviour, of way they should write, and so on, that has been tricky. Again, through the kind of concepts that are incorporated within, um, within the course. Um, the kind of, just the assumptions we make about, you know, well, I, I, if, you, if you like most kind of quintessentially dead white men, but the kind of ideas that there are uh, in, um, uh, in, in education generally. And then the second half of it was this, through assessment, through feedback and feed forward, and through review. Now, what we have done within our school through the review is taking the statistics we ask, we require each course leader to respond to the statistics on race and other forms of diversity. Now, to be clear, we're not blaming course leaders. We're not saying you've got to make it different. You can't overturn 400 years of racism on a course that lasts 12 months. No, but we are saying we want you to respond to it. We want you to, to think about your curriculum. So in, in annual review, it is a discussion. It is a point on the agenda so that it can't, be, um, it can't be escaped. Now, we find this helpful to structure a conversation about or any course, in fact, but especially for the course uh, about which uh, um, I'm, I'm focusing today. The other thing, again, this is a university-wide initiative. We have been, I mean, I've said leadership matters. We are fortunate that we have had um, a pro-vice-chancellor, so a, a, a very senior uh, person in the university, um, who is completely passionate about this stuff, completely committed. Alas, she's retiring this year, but um, I hope that she has set enough in motion that it will be uh, kept going. And she brought in this, what we call Flying Start. Now, Flying Start was funded through um, project money. It is a two-week intensive introduction to the university, tailored for every course, designed to quickly enculturate students and show how the university can operate for them. Now, this is for... Nobody was forced to do it. No course leader was forced to do it. But this year, the great majority did because it was so, it was so successful. So the idea is that for two weeks, and the teacher training course, with part-time, with part-timers, we've had to do it somewhat differently. But the idea is the same, that very quickly, you try and get people to feel at home on the campus, to get them into the library, having borrowed a book, to get them a sense of what it feels like to be in a room like this, to get them to structure friendships, to get them to move around and to work on projects together. And also what's important is that these were long days, is to get students who perhaps have been, well, let's put it this way, very highly supported in colleges, to understand that university, they need to be more independent, and therefore, um, uh, make their own decisions and spend time in the library reading and, and so on. Now, that has all made a difference, but I would say this has been the important thing. Flying Start has also transformed how many of our tutors think about their students and think about the courses. So that's not what it was for. It wasn't designed to change the tutors, but it has done because they've thought about their students in a different way. That, I think, has been, has been important. I've put this one in um, italics because we've not done this yet. This is what we intend to do. Statistics drive universities in England. They drive them. Therefore, getting statistics that can work for diversity are important. <coughs> and we, we will come up with um, a measure of engagement against which courses will be, uh, will be judged. So how often students 
attend, how often students go to tutorials, how often students use the library, whatever. There will be lots of different points to it. And then we will be able to look at that engagement measure against students from different, um, different forms of diversity, whether that's ethnicity or gender or social background, uh, whatever it is. So I do think getting statistics, at least within the English context, that, um, that matters. OK, the School of Education initiatives. These are things that we have done which have helped feed into this, this course. Again, making better course-level data available with achievement versus student-level characteristics. That's, that's been very important. And as I said, asking course leaders to respond to those statistics. We've also employed progress tutors. Now, these progress tutors, their sole job is to look after students, whether they're adult or whether they are you know, traditional young students, to look after them when they are in danger of dropping out. And they are proactive, if you like. They will seek out students who appear not to be, um, who appear not to be engaging. That, again, has been... That has, there's only are two of them, but they have such an impact, partly because they are such, fa frankly, fabulous women, and they just... They are so on it. They are brilliant. But an important principle to all of this, all students can benefit from, from these initiatives. We are not doing anything just for black and minority ethnic students, because that would be... It would be stupid, frankly. It would be stupid. I mean, that's just... Let's be clear. It would be stupid to do that. So what we are doing is we are trying to improve um, the, the experience of all students partly by celebrating diversity in its broadest, in its broadest sense. You know, everybody brings their own diversity, um, if you like. So, a few, a few conclusions. First of all, good data can drive change by exposing inequality. If you get, and it is really important to get good data, because people have to trust the data. If the data is not right, then people can say, oh, the data's never right and then they can ignore it. The data has to be good. I am always slightly concerned. I mean, I, I am a bit of a born-again statistician. Let me, let me be honest. I was suspicious of statistics, and I thought, I need to grow up. You know, I'm in my 50s, I need to grow up. <laughs> and I went and studied statistics. And I, I, I did an MSc, and it's completely masochistic. It's the hardest thing I've done in my life. But I'm so glad I did, and it does slightly concern me that we have so few social scientists who can who can understand statistics. You know, it, it, is, it is an issue. It is an issue. Anyway, good data can drive change by exposing inequality. Thinking about that, um, that data set, the, the so-called unexplained um, difference, having that and showing that to people and say, look, something is going on at this university, that means there is still a nine or ten point gap between the, between the achievements of black and white students with the same entry qualifications. <coughs> Secondly, there needs to be institutional and course-wide responses. So it was important for the teacher training course <coughs> that we carried out research on those tr with those trainees in order to find out what they needed in order for them to, um, to prosper, to succeed on the course. But institutional and course-wide. All of this requires leadership and at every level. Leadership... You know, leadership takes all forms. I'm not suggesting that you have to be in some kind of leadership role. You know, you need to be a dean. I mean people taking control of what they can control, having agency, being committed to diversity, and making the changes that they're able to do within their, uh, with, within their situation. Leadership at every level really matters. You know, I, I, many of the things I've talked about here, they are top down. Um, they would have been very difficult to do from the bottom up if people at the top were not supportive, and I'm glad to say, broadly speaking, they have been. Now, finally, at the University of, of Huddersfield, we have a lot still to improve. You know, we are a very diverse university, but our academic staff do not reflect that diversity. Um, our, uh, our achievement gap is not as bad as, as, as in England uh, on average, but nonetheless, in certain areas, it is, it is uh, well, it is bad. Um, so we have a lot still to improve, but I am glad to say, I am glad to say that many of us are completely committed to doing that, and that makes the University <coughs> of Huddersfield a rather exciting place to work. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy.
happy to take questions. Yeah, absolutely. If you've got, if people questions? got questions. Um, I'm interested in your notion of student feedback and feed forward. I'm very skeptical about student satisfaction surveys. I mean, the notion of student satisfaction is problematic for me. I don't want students to be satisfied. I want them to be challenged and changed and dissatisfied and you know, uncomfortable sometimes. Um, so how, how do you do that? Well, that will differ from course to course uh, as, as to how we do it. Let me say, first of all, that we have in England what's called the National Student Survey. Now, the National Student Survey is a satisfaction survey. It is highly problematic. It really is highly problematic. Um, but it is a very powerful survey it is, uh, that all students that are asked to, to fill in and which, against, which universities are, uh, against which universities are measured. We have to do that. We have to respond to that. What I'm talking about, though, is something slightly different, and it mainly happens within tutorials. So uh, we have, um, a, within the school, we have a tutorial policy that every student has at least five personal tutorials each year. And those tutorials are structured around um, particular, depending on the course, but part of what they will do is trying to ask the student, not just are you happy, but are you challenged? Uh, what is inspiring you? Um, you know, inspiring teaching is something that we don't have enough of. And so it's, it's, it's really in those one-to-one -one, um, uh, discussions. Look, we haven't got it right yet, to be honest. You know, uh, uh, we, because the thing is about students, students come to university because they need to learn stuff. We know more than our students do. That's, that's an uncomfortable fact. We know more than our students. That's why they come to universities. So we need to reveal things to them. We need to kind of reveal things to them in a certain way as professionals. That sometimes means that students are confused. <coughs> now, getting students to understand that confusion can actually be productive because you can work through it, but not so confused that they're anxious, that is something we haven't got right. But that's, it's that dilemma, anxiety and confusion. How do we live with both of those? Jean-Marie Dujardin from the University of Yale, just to share a, a reflection and experience we teach about, we train about teachers, 300 or 400 teachers a year in our university in all the different fields. And what we have observed is that uh, we have also minorities in those candidate teachers, uh, black minorities, Arabic minorities, Asian minorities. And so they have some difficulties to to go through the training and to success in the training. And we are not so good at inclusive approach in pedagogy, I have to say. But what we see is that the one who have succeeded in those mi minorities are very good teachers yeah. because they go in secondary schools where there are also different uh, minorities. And they are very, very good uh, uh, to, to uh, include the uh, diversity and uh, for, for those minorities because they help them very well to succeed at school. So uh, I think it's really a very good uh, topic to work on it, yeah. on inclusive teaching, because they may have really a, a very good impact in secondary schools when they are teachers. I'm, I'm sure you're right. It's, it's highly productive yeah, in, highly in the future. Productive. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Kevin, thanks for your very interesting presentation. Just one point I, earlier on I wanted to raise with you about the gender issues. Mm. And of course I understand that the point you make about getting people into senior management from both genders, which in this case means more women in, in senior posts. But I'm con I want to ask you about the general student profile, which is largely female, and whether that is an issue yeah. in terms of getting greater balance in Scotland, we did some look, looking at this in teacher involvement in preschool education. There's something like seven male uh, teachers involved in preschool in the whole of Scotland, just seven. Yeah. And if you look at figures, even uh, in a project I was involved with, which countries like Sweden were involved, it's still even, although it's much higher, it's still low. 
So is there a general issue about gender, not just to get more females into higher positions, but to have a greater number of male students into um, further uh, higher education? And does, that, does it really matter? I think it does absolutely matter. And I suppose that's also why uh, different courses different within our university, different schools need different responses. So certainly when we talk about um, uh, to trying to improve the gender balance in education, we mean more men. And certainly uh, our experience, especially in primary education, is that there are very, very few men come forward, very few men. And actually, you know, that's, that reflects the, uh, the kind of cultural norms, but it also reflects, within English society at least, a great nervousness about men touching children because of the kind of child scandals that there have been that people are aware of. And that, that has really, uh, that has had, I, mean, I can't, you know, I can't uh, overstate the effect that that has had on, on, um, um, on recruitment. So that is certainly an issue. Whereas, for example, in the School of Applied Sciences, it's quite different. The gender balance means having, um, having, uh, having more women. But certainly, I, thinking about these, these teachers, these college teachers, when I would have first, when I, when I was a college teacher, most of the trainees were male because colleges were mirroring the industry that was available at the time, engineering, and so they were mainly male. As that engineering and, and other industries have fallen away to be replaced by, if you like, more female-oriented or in terms of the uh, workforce, such as beauty therapy, such as childcare and so on, then the teachers are, are, more, are, more, are more female. But I do think it's an issue, yeah. Thank you, and I enjoyed everything, but I do want to offer a counter perspective around men in teaching. Um, I think it's much more about how we essentialise women as carers. I think it's throughout all caring professions, healthcare, um, yeah. school, anywhere where there's an aspect of care, it's determined a female role, and I think that that's You're quite right. the, the biggest factor. Yeah, no, I, I accept that. Thank you. This was very interesting and I just had to reflect on that one little story you were telling about uh, telling students how to dress when they apply for whatever job and I think oh, we are doing these courses or we used to do them also and I, I was just, I just saw that what a nonsense. Why should we tell anybody how to dress to, it's like, it seemed to me like a masquerade, just wear and show who you are. Uh, really to, to see. Be comfortable. Yes, and, and if, because then you, you, you accept this job, you get it because you are, I don't know, and, and, and then you have to wear that all the time, and if you don't feel comfortable with that, so why don't you show yourself? Only if you show yourself, you will find out who's your friend and who's your enemy, otherwise you will never find out. <laughs> I don't always, I, I'm not sure, I, can, I mean, I, I wish that were true. Look, <laughs> I know this. <laughs> I, 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 always, I always tell my students, if I don't know what I'm doing, I wear a suit. If I really don't know what I'm doing, I wear a shirt and tie. And uh, you can see I'm wearing a suit. I, 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 partly, I partly know what I'm doing. I, exactly. Uh, in, in jeans. But I, I, I know that as a man, I am treated differently if I wear a shirt and tie. Uh, completely. So I, I wish that were correct. I wish that were correct. Just on the dress issue and the dress codes, I think it is really problematic for all of us going for interviews about what to wear. And I also think that a lot of people don't even get interviews because of the name that comes up yeah. on the yeah. on the CV. Um, I know I have relatives who uh, are Irish. Uh, both parents are Irish, but they have Indian names. And when they use those names, um, they don't get interviews. I also have uh, friends who have unusual surnames and they changed their name by deep poll in order to be sure that they would be yeah. invited for interview. So it isn't even when you get there what you're wearing, it's when you fill out your CV that you're in trouble. And I think, you know, if you want to work in an organisation and if you think it's the place for you and you're desperate to get a job, you'll do whatever is necessary and that's the reality, you know. You wear the shirt and tie or you'll take off the scarf or you'll put on the, the uh, the trousers if you feel that's what's going to get you in the door. Um, because people are desperate for work yeah. and for places to work that will 
accept them. And if you've been unemployed for a long time, like a lot of people have, and particularly during the recessionary years in Ireland, people were not getting jobs. They had fabulous degrees, PhDs, everything. And they were not getting jobs. They couldn't get them. So they were working in McDonald's and working in all of those kinds of places. And some of them are still working in them. Yeah. So I think, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric about the job market too and what's there. And um, we're, we're, we're very often blaming uh, people for not being skilled enough for the jobs. But actually, it's the actual labor market that's the problem, uh, not the people. Absolutely. And I think that's something that we need to really start thinking about as well. What kind of a society have we at the moment that only, I mean, all of these um, corporation jobs that are available can be quite deadening. People working in them don't like to be working in them. They're getting well paid and they're getting shares in the company, but they have to go into work every single day and, uh, you know, sort of market themselves in that context. And it's, it's not always a very nice place to work, even though people feel that that's where they should be, working in Google or working in Amazon or working in Facebook. You know, that's the elite. When they get there, they find it's a very different story. So the job market itself is a problem, and I'm not sure what we can do about that. We really do need to start thinking, and I think the conference coming up in, uh, in, in Porto in the summer is going to start asking some serious questions yeah. about the sustainability of the labor market, and I think that's you know, a, a really good thing for you, Kent, to be talking about. I would agree, and just to, to um, reiterate that, within, say, we do have good statistics in the UK, so we have a data set that's called the Longitudinal Educational Outcomes, and it follows people from school, and it, this is not a sample, this is the whole population. So they are followed from school, through college, university, and then what they pay in tax. So what we know from this, in 2016, in 2016, one quarter of students in England who had left university 10 years before were earning £20,000 or less a year after 10 years. The average wage at the time was 26000 So a quarter of students, after 10 years, we're earning less than 20,000. So there is um, the promise that we make, at least in England, the promise that we make that <coughs> higher education leads to better jobs is simply not reflected in the statistics. So I, I, I completely agree with you, Josephine. You know, I think we need to be careful that we're not complicit as higher education academics, that we're not complicit in a lie. You know, there is more to education than getting a job. There is more to education than getting a job. Of course there is. But, you know, it, it, just, just because there are more skilled people does not mean there are more skilled jobs. I was interested in the Flying Start program. Yeah. Was, was that a program about social integration and uh, academic integration as well? Or yeah. what was the... Could you tell a bit more about sure. the details of the programme? Sure. So th it, it was about <coughs> social and academic <coughs> integration. So, for example, within our school, um, many of our, uh, we, we have many uh, young women who uh, live, live locally, and we wanted, them, we, we wanted to get them thinking beyond their experience, because their experience of life has been quite limited. The way these people, uh, these young people, will talk about going to Leeds, which is half an hour on the train, is like I might talk about going to... Paris, you know, it, it, their, their lives have been restricted. And so we uh, took them out on visits. We got people who uh, are working in the occupations that they want to, to work in to come and speak to them, to give them a sense of what they, what they could achieve. Um, we also got them to, and we, we, you know, it, carrying out research on this has been astonishing for me. Our campus is relatively small. Okay, it's relatively small. There's a canal that goes, goes through it. Now, I walk around that campus all the time, and I think nothing of it. When we researched th with, these, um, with these young women, many of them felt uncomfortable even leaving our faculty, never mind crossing the canal or going to the library. So one of the things that we tried to do was give them a sense that the whole university was there, the sports facilities, the, um, the different the, the students' union, and, and so on. So there was that social integration as well as the academic integration, expectations of the amount of time that we would expect um, students to study individually and what that is like. It's not just saying you have to go and study, but trying to structure the study so that they might um, get a sense of what, getting a sense of what many middle class kids 
just absorb, we are trying to instill that into, into young people um, who haven't had that experience. So it's social and academic. Voice is not strong enough. <laughs> um, actually, I have, thank you very much for the presentation. I have two questions. Um, one is you were talking about the students and you know when they arrived at the university and that you, you know, because they were living and or they are living at home. So I was wondering. Well, one thing is also to think about modes of delivery. Is yeah. also <coughs> thinking about the timetable, but thinking. Does everything need, is everything, um, or must everything be at the university or face to face, or could you do things online? So that's one question. What did you think about modes of delivery yeah. uh, going further than a timetable? Yeah. And the other thing, actually, that was on one of your, um, of your slides was on the progress tutors. And I was just wondering, maybe you said it, but I, I didn't sure. hear it. Sure. But I was just wondering, what is behind that? Because I think that could be a quite interesting concept. Thank you. First of all, on the, on, on the, um, the aspect of, of online, that is something that we've considered. Yeah. Now, many of our, especially the young um, female students, many of whom are Muslim, they have caring responsibilities at home. We want their families to understand that studying is full time. So therefore, we are trying to timetable them as much as possible in the university. Because we know, they tell us, that when they're at home, they find it hard to work because there are distractions. So at least, you know, this is why you have to do it at course level. So the kind of courses that I'm involved in, um, that uh, certainly for, if you like, the young students rather than adult students, the, the if you like, the normal age students, sort of 19, 21, uh, we try and get them into the university, um, precisely because they, they cannot do it at home. For the adults, it's different. In adults, we have brought in much more blended learning, so that we still expect face-to-face, -face, but there is much more online. Um, and that suits many, but not all. You know, it isn't, uh, but certainly the, the, we could try to do it. On the progress tutors, the idea behind the progress tutors, this was an idea that we took from further education colleges. Further education colleges are very, very good at keeping students there, at keeping students on course. And so we simply, I mean, many of us, myself included, taught for a long time in further education. So we just took what was good practice in further education, having a progress tutor whose only job is to keep students there. So if that means they have to go and knock on doors, if that means that they have to accompany students to uh, an appointment with social welfare, or they have to go with the student to the library because they're not sure how to take out a book, whatever it takes, that's what they do. And they are, I wish we had more of them. I wish we had more of them. But it's, it's, it has been, it's been worth their salary. Let's put it that way. means it's about assisting or like going yeah. with the students and yeah. supporting them when they have to do something at the campus because I was thinking about the progress, about learning pro uh, progress in, a, in another way. Yeah. So um, <coughs> like, um, yeah, you know, facilitating or like looking, uh, you know, that they could get feedback. How, how are they? How are they progressing? Something that could help them too. Do you have something like that too? We do. We have academic skills tutors. Okay. Who um, and so, uh, uh, but they're they're if you, they're normal, you know. That's every so that the progress tutors is something for us. For us, it's, it's something different. They are purely focused on keeping that student on program. Yeah. Okay. This close uh, mentoring or tutoring. Do, do you think that really? Does it make the students too depending on people? And how can be affecting their evolution? Because really, what you want is to, it's like uh, growing a child. If you are all the time on top, it's all the time needing you. But Abs absolutely. How, do you, how do you face that? Look, I, I th that is the classic dilemma. It's the classic dilemma of teachers. Teachers give support, 
and then they take support away. And that is, look, that's a dilemma every day for me and my colleagues. How much support do we give? When do we say to a student who keeps knocking on the door, I'm not helping you anymore? So I, look, I, I have no, I wish I did have some glib solution, here it is. I don't. Every day, professionals have to make decisions as to when to support and when to say, you're on your own. Exactly, exactly. Sure. Multitasking here. Uh, thank you very much for showing us this very practical table with uh, yeah. different questions and and so on. I was wondering if you could say a few more words about the concept of feedback and feed forward yeah. and how you use those. Well, I, I suppose uh, uh, feedback. The idea of feedback and feed forward. I mean, that this that to be and again to be clear, this came from Kingston University. I mean, I, I do want to you know. I'm, give it its proper provenance, and I think it's, I think it's excellent. So the idea of, of feedback is what we have traditionally done with students. Students give us work, they hand in an assignment, let's say, or give a presentation, and we say it was good, it was bad, or it was whatever, you know, you, whatever. The feed forward is much more about um, what you will do in the future, how you will improve what you're doing. So it is good feedback has always, include feed for, has always included feed forward. But feed forward is, is a term that is being used within educational uh, circles. I think it's come from America, to be honest. But nonetheless, the idea that, is that feedback is often just, just look backwards, what you have done. Feed forward actively gets tutors to think about what the student will do in the future and how they can be supported, encouraged, educated in order to um, achieve more in the future. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I was wondering where it came from, the term, because in, in German-speaking countries we don't use it yet very much. So I, I mean, it, it, to be honest, it's one of those terms that doesn't slip off my tongue very easily. It feels a bit forced. Um, but that says more about me than it does about the words, you understand? <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 the, the idea of feed forward, I think, is, is, is a very useful one. You know, I, uh, I, insofar as it gets tutors to think about in, in chronological way, what the student has done and what the student will do. Uh, Kevin, you are talking about working with quite small groups of students. Yes mm, or no? no. How no. many students on a course? Well, it depends on the course, but um, well, it depends what you call by sm it depends what you call oh, small well, groups. Well, of course, but, yes. So for, for the for the uh, teacher education students, that is quite small. I suppose the groups are about thirty, something like that. So because my question is, to what extent is your model upscalable? To use a horrible word, but yeah. how do you upscale that model to talk about courses with three hundred students, well, four hundred students? How do you? Do you do that? Or absolutely. How? No, no, I, I, absolutely. And I think, look, it's much harder. You know, we're saying how hard it is to, you know, to change, for universities to change. Small courses are much easier to manage. They're much easier to make changes. But when you have courses of many hundreds, now we, we don't have many courses that big within the School of Education, but we do elsewhere in the university. And um, they are harder, you know, that's, they are harder. But nonetheless, that structure, that... That the, the table is still a way of thinking about the course. Flying Start was something that happened with all courses, whether there were 15 on the course or whether there were 300. That was an, uh, uh, that was an approach. The statistics <coughs> are there whether there are 20 on the course or 300, and the statistics drive the change. So I, I, I think that much of this is scalable, but it is much harder to make changes in larger courses. Because it's harder to know your students. I mean, your model is based on knowing your students, knowing their background, knowing their, their aspirations, knowing their strengths, their weaknesses, them knowing you. And it's very difficult to do that if you have 400 students. I Just remembering their names. Well, I, no, I, I, absolutely. But that's why, look, the statistics really matter. The statistics allow you to make certain predictions cautiously, cautiously, but if you have students who you know, come from the local area, come from um, an area which is of, of, 
uh, high social deprivation, for example, you can make certain assumptions about what they're going to, what, what they have not experienced and what you want to, uh, and what you want to do for them. So that's why I think, for the, especially for the larger courses, having good data helps. It helps. But yes, it's hard. I mean, I, you know, I always say within, within the university, the hardest job is being a course leader. You know, it's not being the rector or the vice chancellor. The hardest job is being a course leader and knowing your students. That's the most demanding job. True. Yeah, it is true. Hello. Uh, uh, I want to get, get back to, to the question about um, uh, tutoring and, and things like that. Because I, I work with uh, specialization education in Finland. And it's uh, part-time studies. And they are people who are uh, qualified they are already they already have a, a degree and they ca can, can come back for a specialization education and now listening to you talking about uh, the need of, of uh, tutoring them I, I I know I knew that they should be tutored more <laughs> because it's a pilot course yeah. but we were now very many uh, working together because it's a new thing in Finland and, uh, and, and I have made similar courses within the co continuing education. So I have experience about, about what it needs when you are working and, and studying at the same time. So, so in fact, I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but like, I, I was now, I'm now working with a lot of people from the ac academic, uh, ordinary academic side. And they are used to a different kind of, of, of tutoring. And, and now I see that, that that's what is lacking very much. So when you ask if it's like um, helping them too much or making them dependent, I wouldn't say because these are peop highly qualified people mm. with highly qualified jobs. But, but, but the question is to combine, combine like, like the work and, and, and studies. Mm. And, and also when uh, you, Pat, talked talk, talk about knowing your students. I don't think the, the, the really clue is, is that you need to know everybody's name or, or yes, you need to know if you have a small group, but, but like knowing your students, like we talked yesterday, is also to know that they are commuters that, or, or that they are highly qualified uh, people who try to combine their studies and their work and that it's a hard job to do. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and you have to, to, to take in consideration that we are humans, and even if you are highly qualified, it's hard to combine many things and, and, and be focused. And, and it's very easily happen, happens that you fall out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's not, not always a question about how qualified you are. But life is going on, and and, and it's yeah. hard. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if you actually have any kind of training for these tutors or mentors, whatever you call them, and how do you prepare them for the task? The progress tutors. Yes. yes. There is no training for them. What? Um, <laughs> I, there, there, I'm, sure there's, I'm sure there should be. What we did we, when we advertised for the post, they've only been in place for 18 months. We advertised for the post and we knew that people from further education would apply and they did. So they were trained, if you like, informally. Briefed. Briefed, yeah, if you like, in, in, in further education. And then we poached them, to use a footballing term. Do you think they would need some training or some you know, guiding, guiding them. Look, I'm sure they would do. Let me, uh, let me put it in these terms. Within, within the university, we, some, some of the, the different parts of the university have got what they call graduate teaching assistants, okay? Now these are young, generally mid-twenties, and they, are, um, they work with the, with the students. Okay, that's fine. The people that we have as progress tutors, they are older, mm -hmm. they are paid more as well, actually. They have a certain how can I put it? Life experience. They are, they have a wherewithal about them. Mm -hmm. And a, a confidence, if you like. 
And that's what was crucial, really, I think, that they had experience of, 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 of education, experience of life, and um, that they were you know, paid to, to take on a responsible job. So I think the training matters, but I think that having, choosing the right people and paying them properly mm -hmm. is um, probably more important. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I, I just wanted to say, if there are no other questions, we were uh, going to have a brainstorming session. But I think we've kind of had it already. <laughs> and we, we only have 10 minutes, which is fine, no problem. Um, but when we talked about the brainstorming session that we might have, yeah. one of the questions we, w we wanted to invite people to respond to is this whole business about data. Uh, Kevin has, uh, is in praise of data. I am. I also did a master's in social research methods, which was uh, highly statistical. And I did a lot of work in the early days of the yeah. HF EFC data, trying to understand, uh, and the devil is in the detail, of course. Um, and it appears that the data has improved enormously since I was working on it. But the other thing that strikes me is I live in France. Now, it's illegal to collect some of this data in France. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're not allowed to ask people what their ethnicity is. It's an illegal question. So and there are all kinds of reasons for that, and I sometimes sympathize and sometimes don't. And, you know, I, I, but I understand that this is not just uh, a French problem. And when we have worked in UK trying to get comparable data, I mean, Eurostat data is at such a general level that you can't drill down into it, because once you drill down into the data, it's not comparable anymore. Um, because of the different political and ideological and cultural differences in the way countries collect data and so on. So I wonder if anybody would like, it was one of the questions we thought we might pose in, in a brainstorm and nobody's raised it. So I just wonder if anybody has any comment about the, 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 the kind of data that Kevin has available to him, which I know is not available in many other countries at national, institutional, or regional level, or in any form at all. And, and whether you think you can, for example, uh, should be arguing for better the data collection systems, or not, or do we live with the problem, and if so, how, and does it matter? Uh, does anybody want to have uh, some comment on that question? Uh, really, I'm not talking about Portugal because in my university I usually get the data I need. Uh, after passing all the official legal data protection regulations, but I usually get it. But during Alium project in UCAN, we designed four tools, and tool number four was for collecting data in, in, throughout Europe in universities. And it was a very, very difficult tool to produce due to the diversity of realities within uni U Europe universities, European universities. So if we want to preserve diversity, which I think we should, that will always be a problem, mm. which does not mean that we cannot come to a common uh, yeah. platform of uh, common data uh, release from the institutions, legally and officially and all that, mm -hmm. but it is really not uh, an easy an easy mm -hmm. thing to do, from our experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you want to say something? Sorry. We have to close after Isabella, you know, because life is at one o'clock, we'll stop after that. I have one sentence. <laughs> I can't believe a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I know you. Please do. Please do. I cannot say a half a sentence. It's either. not a question of belief. Okay. <laughs> By the way. Okay. okay, just just a quick note. I think that I understand the point about data, data protection, 
the problem is, well, I was tempting to say, look at what that idea of blindness towards different has brought us all in France and beyond. The problem which try not to get access to personal data because you, you really don't want to intrude on people's lives has resulted in whitening, and exactly. I'm using this with terms of commerce, uh, reality. Is this idea that you don't see the differences. You must see the differences yeah. if you want to have equal treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Equal treatment r depends on recognizing diversity. And if you don't ask a student, you're saying it's, it's the course director that has the trouble. Yeah. So if you don't ask the student if he has some kind of disability, how does he feel about not being white or not being a majority uh, uh, language speaker or whatever, in fact, you are just treating everyone as equal. I don't want to know when yeah. this is a terrible thing. In order to recognize diversity, you have to ask these questions. And I think that data protection uh, is, has a very significant role in some cases on contributing to this very blurred vision of yeah. reality that that helps, in fact, nothing and nobody. And I, I think here, here. it tends to promote here, here. Well, like alternatives which are worse. You yeah. know, in France doing something on people's names, how accurate is that? You know, if you are third generation, fourth generation, you might have an Algerian sounding first name or second name. It doesn't mean that you are... You can ask how they self-define. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. No, but what I mean is, no, but what I mean is, I don't care. I know, but what I mean is, if if you don't do that, you get these very suspect proxies being used, which are absolutely awful in my view. You know, um, you you use proxies which are not representing the question you really want to ask, but you're not allowed to. Um, and and these these proxies are really suspect. Really suspect and and, and racist in their, in, in their underpinning very often. And so I would prefer to ask the question openly and honestly and enable people to self define themselves, self define, than to try and use, get round the legal problem in some other kind of way which is very suspect and very ideologically based and very racist in many senses. But we have a legal problem. Yeah. Balai, one sentence, you promise, <laughs> and then Emmanuel, and no, then we close. The one <laughs> sentence is that uh, international organizations, well, intergovernmental, all of them, uh, raised this issue. Uh, UNESCO, UIL is uh, been in the midst of this next global report on art learning on participation measurement instruments and related indicators. So uh, <coughs> you can may make a proposal for UIL to include a chapter on university lifelong learning and some aspects to be developed. Mm -hmm. And another thing is that uh, OECD is very much open, although it's again intergovernmental, uh, that the survey related to PIAC yeah. can be extended to higher education. Because I think in higher education there are a lot of adult learners and it is very much an un researched or non-researched focus and I think that could be because PIAC is kind of progression also in the structure itself so it might be again addressed by you can maybe there's an alliance with EUA to extend it to higher education based learning of adults that's all thank you so much okay. you yeah, a quick one I, uh, just to support this question that I thought in blunt ways is not helpful, it's almost stupid because I have a PhD student and we have to confront this issue now. She's doing a comparative study of USA and Finland. And in Finland, we don't talk about race. We don't ask that question, not even ethnicity. And we have to grapple around, hiding around, going in around. And it doesn't make sense. And we are all asking why? Because for me, it's not offensive to ask me, who are you to define Absolutely. yourself? Absolutely. Why would Again, yeah. Yeah. people think that it's offensive to ask me these questions. When yeah. it there are people who feel it's offensive to ask. And they don't have to answer. But they don't have to answer. Exactly. It's, it's the freedom, it's exactly. the freedom to say you don't have to answer this. Mm. 
but not to make it a collective thing, like, because it doesn't support research. We yeah. don't know how to answer this question, and it doesn't make it very comparative. Going back to statistics and all this stuff, I feel it's something that we can talk about um, all up for opening up data and information. Thank you. Okay, so I think that we need to close now. It's lunch time. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.